off and running. Okay. okay. So here we are. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the North Country Herbalist Guild. Uh, this is our first meeting of 2021. We're in February and we've got the lovely, wonderful Miss Margie Flint with us. We're so excited to have you. Um, compliments of uh, COVID because you are out east, uh, just outside of Boston, I was learning and quite close to the harbor. Um, so, and I'm Laura Sandin, I'm the current president of the Guild and we're a nonprofit, um, we're a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to uh, education, herbal education. So, and no one better to educate us than Miss Margie. She's been around forever doing it since before it was cool. And um, <laughs> she's going to tell us about aphrodisiacs and uh, whatever else takes her fancy. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Margie. I'll mute myself and make myself small, but I'll be up in the corner for you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So nothing like teaching a class on aphrodisiacs to torture you during COVID if you're not in relationship. But here we go. <laughs> so I'm going to begin with... Um, really talking about nutrition first because a lot of issues that come up about aphrodisiacs are about a lack of libido or a lack of energy or a lack of interest at all whether you're with a partner or on your own you still have a libido and you still have to be satisfied so um i like to begin with demulsants because demulsants if anyone has studied with Matthew Wood, um, demulsants feed the extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix is, is the magic around every cell that contains the magic fluid that keeps us, keeps every cell in our body connected to ourself. And so demulsants in the herb world are things like marshmallow root or slippery elm bark or okra, or uh, comfrey, or hibiscus. I mean, there are so many yummy demulsants, flax seeds or chia seeds, all of those create slime. And we need to have slime from our mouth to our anus. And without it, you're not healthy. And um, as herbalists, we know how important it is to stay moist and juicy, as Hildegard von Bichten said. You know, she wrote to the Pope and said, always ended her letters with stay moist and juicy <laughs> to the Pope. I kind of like, I like that. And then another demulcent that is very interesting is cinnamon. You know, we've seen the slime that cinnamon makes if you let it sit. But cinnamon also increases blood flow to the penis. So therefore also to the vaginal tissues. We're all the same in the beginning. And then we split into our different sexes. So, you know, cinnamon is a very interesting, stimulating, warming, and demulcent herb. So if we can incorporate all these incredible nourishing foods into our diet, that gives us the the juicy fluids we need to be juicy so um and i will include in that for our immune systems the medicinal mushrooms which are rich in polysaccharides so polysaccharides are sort of the the um the magic so um and i I don't know of a big mushroomer in your area, but uh, I'm sure you have somebody who's fabulous. You know, my personal favorite is George Vaughn from Mushroom Harvest. His mushrooms tested out with the highest polysaccharide count than anyone. So they're steamed and dehydrated, fabulous food. And, and so that way you kind of prime the pump. You know, what do you need to stay moist and juicy? good nutrition, good water, and good oils. So you, it, you have to use it or lose it. If you wanna be amorous all the days of your life, you know, my dad was 95 and a half when he died, still frisky. So limited thoughts. If people say, oh, once you're a certain age, you know, that's the end of it. It's like, no. Um, but we have with herbs pathways 
to really enjoy and explore further exploration in life as the years go on. And I just sort of assume that we're talking about aphrodisiacs later in life, but the truth is in my practice, I've had young people, you know, under 40, complain about a lack of libido, which astounds me, you know, I mean, I never needed any aphrodisiacs until I was, I don't know, 40 or older, 50 maybe. But um, young people are complaining of a lack of libido. And I think that could be from the influence of pesticides and fertilizers and genetically modified foods, which all convert to estrogen. So they basically feminize men and we don't want that to happen we like our men to have a natural libido you know and and so uh, with age the other thing that happens as we gain in years is you stop making as many enzymes as many amino acids and you stop making as many stem cells so incorporating into your diet um, foods that herbs that are rich to to encourage the making of your own stem cells is really the goal. So, you know, what are some common herbs that will build stem cells? Echinacea, cannabis. Um, there are so many powerful, wonderful herbs. Uh, I think ashwagandha might be in that category. I didn't actually make a huge list, but astragalus is in there. And one of my favorites is Monarda fistulosa. So that's um, the light purple Monarda. So it's in the bee balm family, but it's not the red one and it's not the dark purple one. It's got fewer petals and Monarda fistulosa. When you feel the leaf, it feels very buttery. And, um, you know, the doctor and his signatures is for that one is for burning of any kind. And frequently elder women will complain about having a burning sensation while making love because it hurts. So, yeah, there's an interesting concept. Why does it hurt? Well, as I said, you need demulsants. So enough oil, enough water, enough foods that are giving you the juices that you need to stay moist and juicy and not dry up like an old prune. It's very unattractive. So um, cordyceps is another uh, a fungi we can call on. And cordyceps, when you look at it, you know, it's growing off this poor little ant. And then it grows up and it really looks like an erection. And, you know, I, I do think there is a oops, doctrine of signatures for these things. So um, I do like to call on uh, interesting and delicious things. Another one that is very interesting is turmeric. So just telling somebody, yeah, in the evening, have a cup of golden milk with your partner or if you're on your own with yourself, and you make your golden milk and turmeric is actually a little um, aggravating to you a little bit and it's antioxidant and it gets rid of inflammation. And many people as they age have inflammation happening in their bodies in various places. Plus it helps you sleep. So, you know, these are rituals that you can get into so that you're actually ready to make love. Um, so the, uh, the pathways to the brain, to our thought patterns, you know, it, you know, I always tell people lock the door, unplug the phone and have the kids go somewhere else. You know, <laughs> it's like, you want to have a romantic time. You have to create an atmosphere and it's good to get out of the same old place that you're in all the time and be experimental. And I can definitely tell you that, you know, at the age of 70, you could still learn new things that you didn't even believe could be possible. 
you know, so there is no lack of learning that happens. There isn't a point where all of a sudden, oh, I know everything about sex. I used to think that because I would teach botanica erotica and I thought, oh, I'm such an authority. <laughs> then I had a new teacher. So I am now beginner's mind. So, you know, don't, don't ever give up on new learning and new experiences because part of the joy of having this human body is learning new things and having new experiences and being open to it. And I think that the, the concept of being open to a new experience with your partner is very important because so many people in long-term relationships say, well, I'm just not, you know, I'm not turned on by her anymore. Well, that's in your mind. You know, you have to figure it out. And if need be, David Bruce Leonard has a wonderful series of relationship um, uh, assignments that I'm happy to share with you all. And I'm sure David would be too, um, uh, that help communication skills between partners happen. So David Bruce Leonard, if none of you know him, um, he wrote the book, How to Worship the Goddess and Keep Your Balls. And I, you know, I don't know what it was in that book that explained the way men think, but somehow I understood more how men think after reading that. So I recommend it to everyone. Oh, let's see. So, um, so how do we begin to relax? We do all those things I talked about, and then there are herbs that we can call on that are relaxing. So I love Godicola. Um, Godicola is one that they say in Hawaii, if you eat three Godicola leaves a day, you will live forever. You know, it's anti-inflammatory, it increases testosterone. Um, you know, it's a delicious, you can graze on it. You know, you can get right down on the ground and graze on Godicola, it's delicious. Uh, so we want to have herbs that are delicious and stimulating. My all time favorite herb for cordials is Damiana. And Damiana increases testosterone and it increases the ability to get an erection. So the peripheral stimulants, the blood circulation herbs are all very important. So who are those? So we now I have to say with the circulatory herbs, we want to use a little bit of caution if somebody is on blood thinners. So, but the ones I use are Hawthorne. You know, why would you not use Hawthorne in an aphrodisiac? Hawthorne is like, I want to experience love. I want to open my heart. And it's like love. You know, it has the beautiful red berries and the beautiful leaves. And then it has thorns, just like a real relationship. You know? No, it's like roses. It's in the rose family. So rose and hawthorn are definitely right there um, for my favorite stimulants. And I do like to use uh, prickly ash. If men have a hard time getting and keeping an erection, then prickly ash is great because it's such a, a great peripheral stimulant. It brings the energy and blows up the balloon so it'll work. Um, Cinnamon will do that also. And some men react really well to either sassafras or soy sarsaparilla. And both of those shrubs are, well, no, let's see, sarsaparilla is not a shrub, but sassafras is. And some men absolutely love those. And you have to kind of play with it. It's like, which herb works. So you could do drop pulse testing, you know, where you uh, drop the herb onto the vein and see the reaction of the person to that herb. And one will be better than another. 
and who knows, you know, every person is unique and needs to have their own formula. Um, of course, ashwagandha is a classic, strong as a stallion. They usually say that it's about the scent, but I say, no, it is not just about the scent. I had a client that I had ashwagandha and his formula and his wife complained. <laughs> So he made me take it out. Can't quite imagine that. Um, so uh, another favorite herb of mine is epimidium. Uh, do you know epimidium? It's a beautiful, it, it makes a beautiful ground cover and it has these very thin stems with beautiful heart-shaped leaves. And when the slightest wind comes by, it trembles. It's like, I want to keep it up, but I can't, <laughs> you know. So epimidium is for the, you know, not having that um, ability to maintain an erection or even sometimes just to get an erection. Um, so epimidium, fabulous herb and so beautiful. It's a great plant in your garden. It's, it's, uh, gorgeous. Uh, let's see. Rose, do I need to even talk about Rose as an aphrodisiac? Um, Rose, I probably put in every aphrodisiac formula I've ever made. And I like to, um, when I'm making a cordial formula, I use tinctures. The Damiana tincture that I use, I make a percolation of so if anyone doesn't know how to what that is put it in the chat and then i'll explain it otherwise i'll move on but um the having that true taste of damiana is so important so i'll have damiana and then whichever herb is specific to that couple and then a little bit of hawthorne don't know explain please okay um, so a percolation is you would take, a, like a water bottle, a Perrier bottle or something, and you cut the tip off. No, let's see. You cut the base, the top, the bottom of the bottle, you cut off. This bottle is upside down. You pack your herbs in, in three different layers fluffy, a little more compacted, a little more compacted, and then you put a piece of paper and a rock on it. And then you unscrew the cap so that it makes a constant drip, one drip every second. And your entire percolation is completed within 24 hours. So instead of five day tincture, two week tincture, whatever, because bitter principles come out after five days. So a percolation has all the sweetness of the herb in it. Um, if you, I'm sure you could probably Google that and find directions. And they probably, I think Jim McDonald's makes a um, percolation bottle that you could write to him for. Um, but percolations for things like Damiana or Calendula, where you want the flavor to maintain that beautiful sweetness without the bitter principles. You're not looking for bitter principles in an aphrodisiac. You want the sweetness of life. So yeah. we're getting a, a, few com a few questions about the percolation. One of them okay. is, is it then over a jar? So is it... So you have... And if what is the menstruum up, for the percolation? Percolation using water, alcohol. vodka, or wine, alcohol, alcohol? Any particular alcohol? I always use, use brandy because that's what I like. Um, you could use vodka, brandy, tequila, whatever you want, but it you need to dampen the the herb. It has to be ground. Excuse me, I haven't made a percolation in so long. You have to grind the herbs so they're very fine and consistent, and then dampen them for 24 hours with your menstruum and then pack them a certain way in three different layers and then 
pour the rest of the alcohol in very slowly. It's a magical process. Um, I could send people directions if they write to me and I will surely find better directions so I can, but we'll see or maybe we I'll send them it, to you. Yeah, send them to me and we'll put it in the follow-up and newsletter okay, and see if we can okay. find YouTubes and stuff like that. Okay, it's great, good. I think yes. that's it. Cut down on 5,000 emails. Yeah. Um, but percolations for anything you want to really have the flavor of the herb maintained is the best way. And I'm sure there are more modern things than just unscrewing the cap. I mean, some people use um, things in the beer industry that uh, let the gases come out and they have a little spigot. I, don't, I haven't gotten that fancy myself. So, but they are absolutely delicious. Makes me wanna go right over to the herb shelf and get some. Um, so, where was I? And then I always put in rose glycerin because you want to have something sweet in your cordial. Either honey, you could put honey in, or I like rose glycerin because rose is so romantic. And that way you've got your alcohol parts and your Damiana and then whatever else you need to have in there to make it work. But guys who have less circulatory power and women too, need to have prickly ash in there to bring the herbs to the extremities. So let's see. Um, so diagnostics for men, I know there was a request for having some facial diagnosis. So this area, is the uterus for the woman and the prostate for the man. So if you see red, rashy, blemishes, any kind of change in color in this area, that will indicate a lack of circulation, too much heat. You know, if it's red, it's too much heat. Um, if it's white, it's not getting any energy. And you can check the nails. If the nails are white in the center, there's no energy going to the center. So we need to have peripheral stimulation in order to enjoy sex. I mean, women's sex glands, you know, our clitoris is actually this gorgeous, um, it's like the little nubbin that every thinks is, everyone thinks, oh, that's my clitoris. No, it goes down and it opens. It's like this beautiful like water wings sort of they look like you would float across the universe with those and when a woman has an orgasm she fills those water wings the same way a guy fills himself up you know we're we just need to match our chakras up um so having enough peripheral stimulation so that you're actually having good blood flow, good arterial, good venous flow is very important. That was a good segue. Um, let's see, it's diagnostics. So, <laughs> and for dating, <laughs> the ring figure is the size the man's penis will be. <gasps> We'll have to do a test on that. Yeah, right. How is that? To, how did you come okay, guys, uh, line up that now. information? <laughs> hey, we've got another question in the chat, which is um, how another diagnostic. You see it about rash redness on the high cheeks, under the eyes, or top of the nose. Is there any correlation? Okay, so those are all different parts of the body. So, okay, so. cheeks are the lungs. Up under the eyes can be kidneys, it can be liver, it can be adrenal, it can be colon. So, um, but not sexual organs. The sexual organs really are all here. So like the chin is definitely pelvic floor on both sexes. So from your TMJ, this is your hip flexors down to the pelvic floor and then uterus and prostate are here. 
if a woman has lines going vertically above her lips, that means cessation of ovarian function. So for me at 70, that would be normal. But for somebody 30 who's coming to you for fertility issues, you would know on that side, that ovary is not functioning. But if she has no lines on the other side, then she could be fertile. So don't say that to her though. You're not allowed to say that. You never want to tell somebody anything bad, only good things. Um, I haven't seen those lines on men yet. So, but red and irritated or pimples, especially for women, pimples when you ovulate either above or below here. Those are the ovaries. This is the cervix, uterus, prostate. If you have a cleft in your chin, that means you have ample sexual desire. It's like, mm, yeah. When you go out to the bar one day, again, you know, you just check them out. The guys with a cleft chin, that's where you want to go. <laughs> and same for women. It, it definitely holds true. If you have a cleft in your chin, you have a great libido. Um, I know I was taught that if you have a small chin, it means you have less reproductive power, but I don't find that to be true because I've seen lots of women with small chins have five or six kids. So, you know, I don't think that one's true. So would you say, oh, there's another question too. Yeah. Let me finish the, what you were talking about with the redness and the pimples then is that, would you consider that heat? Yes. Or work with it that way, okay. Whenever then, there's red, whenever there's red, there's heat. If it's pimples, like if you ovulate and you get a pimple here or here, then it means that ovary is having trouble. And it's correlated with that side. Of I do correlate it with that side. Okay. And then there's a question here about a child born with a birthmark on the chin. What that okay. might mean so, or how to interpret that. William would always say, William Lasasse was my mentor. And he, would, he taught me all the diagnostics. So <clears throat> he would say, wherever you have a blemish or a birthmark or a mole, or a discoloration, you want to pay attention to what is underneath that. So if she was born or he was born with a birthmark on the chin, I would just pay attention to that. I mean, if the, sometimes they're little hemangiomas, they're just little red birthmarks that can turn into nothing ever. It, it's just a wake up call, you know, and because our sexual organs are so tied to the heart and circulation, you also want to pay attention to the nose because the nose is the heart, as is the tip of the tongue. So if you had a pie plate on the round of your nose and it was in quadrants, if something changes on one of those quadrants, that is your physical heart. So you would want to pay attention. Is something happening? You know, is one part of my heart becoming um, blocked so that it's enlarging? You know, what's going on? And um, so there, and then things like hemorrhoids and varicose veins are also heart indicators, venous indicators. So we want to have good blood flow, you know, Get out and exercise. I mean, if you have really good sex, that counts as exercise. <laughs> it's a hard class to teach in COVID. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about androgens. So how do we give men what they need? Well, one thing we can give them is pollen the pollen from various, um, like uh, Scott's pine pollen is, I've used it frequently. It's It works about 80% of the time to increase libido. And David Bruce Leonard uses date palm pine. You know, that's gonna be a lot easier to gather than Scott's pine. <laughs> it's like a huge palm tree. 
So, um, but pollen really does help, but it does not go in solution. So when you have it in formula, you have to shake it before you take it. Um, and then basic things like pumpkin seeds. You need to have zinc for the dink. So men, whenever a man ejaculates, he loses his zinc. We get it, but he loses it. So little bowls of pumpkin seeds around the house, always a good idea. Just remember to wash your hands. Um, so zinc is very important as is selenium. So uh, any man who's got low motility, so you've, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, now we're back to cannabis. You know, is cannabis a good thing to use as an aphrodisiac? Uh, not necessarily. It's like those little sperm get stoned out of their gourd and they're like, dude, check out those vaginal walls, you know, and they're just little stoners, but they don't swim. So, you know, you're, I would not use it as birth control, but your chances of uh, having good motility, good motion in the sperm is not good if you smoke too much. Um, Tammy Sweet teaches that you should have one hit of cannabis every 14 days to feed your endocannabinoid system. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> but if you, know, you want to be very active sexually and produce a child at the end, I would not recommend it. Hey, um, Marg, if we can just go back to the heart and the circulatory, I don't know if you see that question, if there's a, like acne on the tip of the, of the nose, then would that indicate a heart issue or how would you work with that? I would say yes. I would say anytime there's a blemish, a pimple, a blackhead, a little red something, I mean, sometimes you have a little, a little gland that might get, um, you know, if you're a picker, most herbalists are pickers, um, and you have something on the end of your nose or on your chin, and you're always picking at it, you're going to make an irritation. So is it something you created on your own <laughs> that might have begun with something, but probably could be gotten rid of? I mean, if it is from constantly touching something, I teach people to just put your finger on it and don't move it if it's self-caused. If it is a blemish that doesn't go away, that's more serious. Those are more common here. And the blemish that won't go away in this area is usually large intestine and usually has to do with a food allergy. But the nose is the heart. So I would say, yes, pay attention. Okay, uh, let's see. So what we're we talking about, androgens. So pine, ginseng, of course. So ginseng, there are different kinds of ginseng. So there's tianchi ginseng, which is probably should not be called a ginseng, but it's very par powerful for um, libido, as is Chinese red ginseng and American ginseng can be in there as well. They all help men and women to have um, more energy because they affect our adrenal glands. And so much of our libido is a reaction to usually too much adrenal stress, you know, the, the whole HPA access. So you need to chill. If you want to have fun sexually, you have to relax. Ginseng is actually a relaxant in odd ways, even though it's a stimulant. It, it's, uh, what is it called? Amphoteric, it brings to balance. But it does increase testosterone. And, you know, strange things like, I, I love having this picture of the trees here. You know, it, it, Sarah's picture. Uh, young deer antler, 
the velvet on the deer antler is a, um, a way to increase libido for all you hunters out there. Um, tribulus seems to also improve sexual desire and David uh, Bruce Leonard uses tribulus a lot enough so that I have actually, I'm gonna start studying it. I haven't studied it myself, but um, it's great for sexual desire, sexual arousal, increases sensation. I mean, if you don't have good peripheral stimulation, you don't feel somebody touching you, right? So that's not very satisfying. We wanna be able to enjoy and feel everything that is happening to us and, and go deeper into those feelings. Um, I already talked about epimedium, uh, but Shizandra is another one I would put in there. You know, I love the signature for Shizandra, which is um, leaks of any kind. So, you know, whether you're premature ejaculation, dripping after urination, uh, um, for women, you know, laughing, jumping, coughing, and spurting, all any leak at all, crying too much, you know, any or or any orifice <laughs> that is leaking too much, Shizandra is the answer, and it's what it's such a great immune stimulant, um, and such an interesting berry. You know, I actually grow sh sh Shizandra and the. The berry has five different flavors. The last one being bitter, and man, is it bitter! Ooh, it's not one you want to leave in a long-term tincture because it will just be bitter. Um, I can always taste it when somebody has left a tincture too long, and they go, "Oh, here, and then you put Shizandra in it, and I taste it." And go, "Oh yeah, overwhelmed by Shizandra." So short tincture, under five days for sure with that one. Um, nettle root is one that I commonly use with uh, men who have inflamed prostates um, because you don't have a good time if your prostate's inflamed, you know. So nettle root works the best for me. And with pumpkin seeds and watermelon is another one that's great for men. It's like, here, eat this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you think it's all water. But part of it is eating the seeds of the watermelon. And nowadays, watermelons come without seeds, which I think is strange. Um, I talked about cordyceps. Did I talk about go to cola? Oh, yes. Eat three leaves, you'll live forever. Um, and Damiana, okay. Um, Cornus is the carnelian cherry. It's a dogwood family. Yeah. And the the berries will increase testosterone and they warm up and invigorate the yang of the loins <laughs> bring it on um, arugula is a food that you can add <clears throat> to your diet that helps to stimulate the growth the uh, production of testosterone and celery is another food that helps. That's so interesting, you know, cucumbers and celery, uh, kale and spinach and radishes, oats, of course. I mean, so your wild oats. There's a reason that they use that phrase because if you wanna get pregnant, just suck down some milky oats on a regular basis and you will go out like a little frisky horse off in the field jumping around you know it's nice to tap into all that um, pine nuts are another food that you can add to your diet to keep you invigorated uh, I'm not going to cover supplements but again, you know, amino acids and vitamins are important. Um, saffron. Okay, so saffron. Cleopatra used to take milk baths in saffron before she had sex. So we think of saffron as an antidepressant, right? 
you know, it's what turns everything that beautiful saffron yellow. And, but it also is very much an aphrodisiac. It's a little expensive aphrodisiac, but it is a good aphrodisiac. Um, but men should avoid hops. Such a bummer for all those beer drinkers, huh? It's like, if you drink a lot of beer, your libido is gonna go right down the toilet with all that urine. So, you know, avoid black cohosh and hops, wild yam, all the highly estrogenic herbs you wanna avoid. And hops is a main one, you know, it's so estrogenic. So, I don't know, maybe the ladies should drink it and the guys should watch, I don't know. Uh, men should avoid hot water. Look, hot tubs, bad idea, if you want to have babies anyway. But it definitely lowers your libido and it's too hot. You know, you want to create your own heat, not step into something else that's hot. And you don't want to wear tight underwear. You know, bad idea. Um, Let's see. So we talked about cordials and ginseng, prickly ash. Sometimes horsetail is really good. You silica rich foods like oat straw and horsetail are going to be good because they're light bearers. So the plants that bring light in are the plants that make you feel like dancing. You know, Dr. Christopher used to say, if you are depressed, you need to bring light into your body. So horsetail and oat straw are the silica bearers. Like they bring in that light. You know, what is silica? It's what crystals are made out of. So it, it sends and receives energy. It's like, yeah, that's what I want. I want to send and receive. <laughs> so, you know, bringing light in and being light. Don't be so serious. You know, when we're in relationship, we, you know, the work, last thing you want to do when you're in bed being amorous is talk about bills or children. <laughs> no. So we have lots of, we haven't talked about um, lymphatic herbs. So, you know, the pelvic floor in men and women is, is sort of the sump pump of the body. So we need to have movers. So things like calendula, cleavers, um, shepherd's purse that are gonna move lymph. Because if it's stagnant, like if you put your hands on your pelvic floor and it's cold, that tells you something. You know, that area should be warm. Things like moxa can help that or you know, doing breathing exercises where you bring your breath down to your pelvic floor and back up, which is good for your lungs anyway. Um, you know, and we could talk about bladder control, but that's probably another day. Uh, okay, so let's talk about foreplay. So, you know, I've had so many women over the years who say they have painful intercourse and I'll say, well, you know, how much foreplay are you experiencing before penetration? Oh, well, he doesn't like to do that. It's like, well, then don't let him in. <laughs> it's like, sorry, door shut. And until it flows, you're not welcome. <laughs> the welcome mat has not been spread yet. So without foreplay, you should not penetrate. Um, it is so important to have good lubrication. And if you need to make a lube, you know, like I make my famous uh, ride and glide recipe that I formulated for women who had cervical cancer and then they wouldn't stop using it. So um, I realized, oh, it's a sexual lubricant revelation. So my ride and glide, which you can make it, the recipes in the book, is um, wild yam and black cohosh, so highly estrogenic. 
uh, a little comfrey because comfrey is what the beaters, the Native American beaters would use because they kept pricking their fingers. So they had to make an extra layer of skin on the tissue. And um, as women age, sometimes their vaginal tissue gets very thin and it, it hurts and it might tear. So comfrey will build up a little extra layer that's delicious. And then calendula, of course, for any skin issue. And I like to put St. John's wort in uh, and I always use fresh St. John's wort oil. So I'll have my herbs that I make from dry herbs on a double boiler. And then I have my fresh St. John's wort that I made in the summertime. And then I mix them together. And then I'll use, you know, a little beeswax, a little coconut oil, because you want to always want to use something with a little saponin in it. So you can wash your sheets and underwear later. And then, um, I'll use evening primrose oil, um, wheat germ oil, which is vitamin E, and then fish oil. And I like to buy the, the orbs of fish oil and open them so that it's really fresh. And I keep it in the, all of those I keep in the fridge because I don't want any rancid oils used ever. And, and um, so let's see, precious oils. And then I use essential oils that are stimulating and delicious and wonderful. And I have, it seems like I have two camps of people who like different things. One camp loves the like patchouli, sandalwood group. And the other likes the lavender and rose or ylang ylang group. So we have our floral lovers and we have our base note throwback hippie group. <laughs> You know, so I play with the different essential oils with people, but you never want to use more than 15 drops of essential oil in any formula per ounce. So 15 drops of oil per ounce and things like rose and ylang ylang way less because they're very potent and sandalwood is endangered. So make sure you're getting it from a sustainable source. Oh, riding glide. Yeah. So you can apply it with your favorite applicator, whether it's your own finger or some toy or some human. <laughs> and there you go. Um, how are we doing on time? I've lost track of time. We're, good. We're fine. We won't wrap up till about 820. Then we'll start with with questions. So okay. you've got a good, you got a good amount of time. And while we're, while we're connected here, um, there, so we'll just to let everyone know, we will include, we'll put the ride and glide in our follow-up to what okay. you just described and then that people can find that in your book also. I saw it in there. Yeah. Um, and then there was, we are getting a couple of questions about bladder stuff. So if you, if okay, you can I'm happy that to talk bit, about that. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. So I think it's like, 50 to 80% of women over the age of 30 have a prolapsed or, or a dropped um, uterus. And that in turn pushes the bladder down. So when I was young, we were taught all the wrong things. So we were taught while you're peeing, stop the flow of urine and then let go. And that is a Kegel that is so wrong. Don't ever do that. It makes all the urine back up into the bladder and sometimes up into the kidneys. So bad idea. So bladder control, you should be able to hold your urine for two and a half to three hours without any problem. And if, if you're the, a person who has trained yourself that every time you see a bathroom, you go to the bathroom, bad idea. The only way to pump iron for the bladder is to hold urine. Um, but you don't want to hold it longer than that. So teachers are, and nurses are the two famous people who always have bladder stuff because they don't pee enough. You know, they wait till they get home to pee. <laughs> like, or visiting nurses, they're horrible because they don't want to use everybody's bathroom. Um, so 
pee every two and a half to three hours. When you do Kegels, you sit and imagine there's an elevator going from your pubis up to your navel and you have your elevator go up to the first floor, boots and shoes, well, you know, breathe, but hold it there and then tighten a little bit more. And you're tightening by imagining a diagonal line that goes from your pubis to the back of your um, sacrum. So second floor, tighten, oh, scarves and hats. Tighten again, snowshoes, <laughs> whatever. And when you, by the time you get up to the fourth floor, your belly has contracted inward, but it is a controlled small muscle movement instead of the large mammary muscle pulling things in, which actually um, makes you weaker. So it's the little muscles that make you strong. And those you can do like waiting at a red light, waiting in lines at the COVID test site, you know, whatever. Um, and then the other one that I like to do is on a ball, a yoga ball, you tighten your pelvic floor and make the ball move so that your pelvis tilts forward 10 times and then to the side. But you don't want to move your upper body. You're just moving your pelvic, your hips go off. So 10 times to each side and then to the back, but keeping your core stable. And that trains your body to use the smaller muscles. Um, and a good women's pelvic floor expert is fabulous. So the first time I went to a women's PT, <laughs> I was so shocked when she pulled out her little gloves and did an internal <laughs> exam. It's like, well, I wasn't expecting that, but it was great, you know, cause she, you know, she gets in there and tells you which muscles are still working. You know, I mean, I had a huge accident where I was putting the, the huge pavers I have out in the garden down and one of them began to fall. I and mean, we're talking a, like four foot stone this thick. And your natural reaction is just to reach out and hold it. And I tore the ligaments on the left side that went to my uterus, which I didn't realize until the next day when I was out walking and thought I was giving birth. And, uh, but I had a really good doctor who said, I think you tore a muscle. We're not going to do surgery in a year. It'll take you a year. If you do these exercises and see a women's PT, I think you can save your uterus. And I, my uterus is fine. Yeah. So there are, you know, finding good, um, physical therapist or doctor of osteopathy. I refer out a lot. I like to find the best people I can and I'll refer out for a therapist or a physical therapist or a doctor of osteopathy or, uh, you know, whoever, but I, I don't want to do everything, <laughs> especially internal exams. <laughs> so bladder stuff. Did I, um, what are my favorite herbs for bladder stuff? Maybe corn silk is number one. Um, people who would get constant infections is a whole nother story, but things like buchu and uva ursi, cranberry, uh, avoiding sugar are the basics. You know, but anything in that first and second chakra, you always want to, well, actually, any chakra, you want to deal with the emotional state of the person as well. I don't, you know, my people are like this, body, mind, spirit. It's not separate. And if I don't work with the spirit, I never feel like I achieve anything. You know, you have to work with the spirit. If I jump excited, there's a bit of urine that comes out, right? Yep. 
So you need to do Kegels, like I just talked about, and the pelvic. So get a yoga ball, do that thing where you sit on the ball and you can start by making a small spiral, keeping your core stable, but your hips move around and around. And so you go from little to bigger to bigger and then reverse it and go the other direction because you're training your ligaments to function again, to hold your bladder up. Um, or, you know, sometimes there's damage that can happen to the bladder if you make love in positions where the penis is pounding on your bladder all the time. That can not necessarily be a good thing. And um, abuse, of course, causes all kinds of pelvic floor issues. You know, but some many women when they begin menopause they have an estrogen drop and when that that year that your estrogen is trying to find its way to normal again many women have spurting so it may just be a phase if if you're a younger woman then i would see a specialist a women's physical therapist and find out what's happening it's always good you know what western medicine is good at is testing <laughs> and then we can fix them. But it's good to get a solid diagnosis to find out what's going on. Oh, there's a human behind you. Um, orbs of fish. What do you mean there, the eggs? Hmm. Did I say orbs of fish? You were talking about when you were making your um, ride and glide that you use the fresh... Oh, the the, the, is that what you meant? And you broke those them are open? evening primrose oil. Evening or, primrose oil. Yeah, they're like, um, what do they call those? Gel caps? No, they're not caps. They're not pills. They're, they're, good. they're like a, a golden blue. ball. <laughs> a golden orb. But it's not fish oil. It's, it is it's fish soft oil. gel. Okay, we're getting the, the term. Is oh, it's a gel. soft gel. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Vicki. Yeah. So that's what you mean is to use those and you keep it refrigerated because those, that's more fresh than buying the yeah, oil. I always, and... I always keep fish oil in the fridge. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Any other questions that I didn't answer? Well, and I've got a list here going too of questions. Let's, well, let's go over to Q and A. Um, I think, well, uh, let's see. Oh, how do, okay, so there's a question about how um, you recommend using corn silk tea. I, I tincture it as well, but usually when there's bladder issues, I prefer tea. And finding good quality corn silk, oh man, that is gold. Literally, it should be gold if it's brown, useless. But corn silk should be gold. I mean, what a perfect doctrine of signatures. You know, you have your corn, you put it sideways, and each silk goes up to one kernel you know, the nice yellow silk, like urine in the ureter. <laughs> but, you know, non-pesticide growing of corn, really challenging. I know like two farmers who will do that for me. And then I just get this much. It's And it's fluffy. It's like 0.3 ounces for $30. <laughs> Yeah. And then do you dry it then or you use it I fresh? Do, you but I must have dry it. I have, to dry it. have to dry it in the dehydrator because corn silk is very hard to dry. Mm -hmm. If you dry it in the air over a long period of time, it turns brown. So you have to dry it quickly and get it into the jar. And then if you don't dry it enough and put it in the jar, it will grow little Miller moths. Oh. Disgusting. They love. Them. Mm. We have another question here about uh, Damani, Damani, Damani. I don't know how to say it for men. Um, and the the anonymous attendee is saying that um, she was told that women can use it for breast enhancement. Do you agree, or huh. think that other herbs are better for breast? I haven't heard that, um, but 
sounds like a good experiment. I personally will avoid it for that reason, but no, I love Damiana. I don't think that's why I have huge breasts, but um, I haven't heard that. I've heard Saul Palmetto make grows large breasts, but I, uh, new information. Thanks. I'll 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 do a, you know some research on that. Okay, I think we're up, caught up on questions. You guys just keep putting them in the chat or the Q and A, and and um, we'll we'll go as we go. Okay. So some other herbs we haven't talked about are maca. So maca um, affects all the endocrine glands. Um, it's very stimulating. And if I don't have a partner, I actually can't use maca because it makes me insanely frisky. So, um, and you know, on that container, when I bought maca the first time it said, take, you know, two to four tablespoons. I think I took two teaspoons and was out of control. So I would put a caution on that, but maca is very useful as um, a stimulant for amorous activity. And I think it's because it affects all the endocrine glands. You know, if you're in the land of maca, children, you know, they sell maca on the street to everyone, whole families grow up on that and say, wow. Um, so I can't do that. Uh, and a lot of people use kava. Kava is one, another one that I cannot, I mean, I'll use it at the kava ball at the International Herb Symposium when we used to all dance at the same wave. But if you use too much kava, all your muscles relax and you don't want that. So a little bit of kava, David teaches a class on um, making a sexual lubricant. He calls it a tingly lube and he uses kava and I think some Hawaiian herb, I don't know. Um, it's, not a, it's not a plant I'm very close with. So I don't use a lot of kava. I know how to relax. So, well, and we're getting another question along the lines of relaxation in the chat from Betsy Nelson okay. about, yeah, requesting to talk a little bit more about herbs for relaxation, probably particularly just, you know, so much anxiety and craziness going on right now and how to work with that. Okay. Um, yeah, just feeling relaxed, particularly uh, in the root chakra area. So okay. Like security, not feeling safe and grounded. Well, I mean, your root chakra's feeling of safety is largely influenced by your head. So it's thought. So skullcap is one that I use a lot for relaxation. So for um, not, not necessarily before intimacy, but before sleeping, if you can catch up on your sleep with things like um, memulus, the touch me not plant, which is interesting. Um, and skull cap, passion flower. What are all of those? They're all endocrine nourishing plants. You know, our endocrine systems are what suffers when we're stressed out. Our adrenals get, you know, we end up being on guard all the time and we get adrenal fatigue. So that's going to show us black circles under your eyes. Um, and, you know, getting good sleep is really the answer. I mean, during COVID times, I mean, I used to stay up until 11 or something and get up at six. But during COVID, I go to bed at 930 and I get up at seven. I have to have more sleep just to deal with the constant stress that's in the vibration in the world because it's the whole world. You know, it isn't just my little block, you know, or my little country. No, it's the whole world is under stress and we're all connected. Our souls all touch the earth. We are connected to every other living being on this planet. So, a lot of the herbs for arousal 
are also herbs that encourage love. You know, so Hawthorne is a great way. Rose is a great way to relax. I mean, when you have dinner, when I have broccoli, I put rose water on it. Just make sure it's edible rose water. Um, but it's a way to be treating yourself for stress throughout the day that is going to nourish you. Oats, oatmeal for dinner, you know, milky oat glycerite or milky oat tincture, or milky oat tea. And the thing about oats, whether it's oat straw or milky oats, is that you need to have a, a 40 minute decoction. Not You don't just pour boiled water over it and let it steep and drink it. That's like water. 40 minute decoction, you have medicine. It totally changes into a different animal and it is so i mean i had i had a guy who had been in serious pain from a car accident he had broken his back in high school he hadn't really slept well since he took a class with me in college and um i always did a little um mini history before i assigned the herb for the whole semester to them so I gave him, um, I think I gave him passion flower. Was it passion flower or oats? I don't remember. But it, he slept for two days. Herbs will make you catch up with what you need to do. They will take you to the depth of your well so that you can fill yourself up again. Okay, other herbs. Let's see. Um, go cap, go to cola for sure. Because go to cola is for overthinking. You know, it's the vata relaxing. Does everyone know vata pitta kapha? That's fun. Let me see. I'm not getting responses yet. Okay. Um, but vata is all about thinking too much. So we can't always be in our heads. We want to feel. You know, if I'm always in my head, I, I'm not as much fun. Yeah. And I do think a lot because I'm always thinking about the puzzle of clients. Why aren't they getting better? I've done all the things that always work with everyone else. And why aren't they getting better? You know, it's, it's always a mystery. You know, the, how are we going to find the missing piece that makes somebody sleep well, be relaxed, learn to laugh again, learn to relax all the muscles in their body again. You know, this constant state of tension makes people constipated. You know, it's like Americans are really uptight. We have the most constipated country in the world. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? Colon Vana. <laughs> Let's see. What have I forgotten? Did I talk about pheromones? No, you did not. Yeah. Okay. So I use a lot of essential oils. I love essential oils. And when you are excited, you exude pheromones from your armpits, your anus, your breasts, you know, you exude a scent and then your partner reacts to that scent. Um, a woman has to like be in the guy's armpit to actually be stimulated by his pheromones. But a woman can walk into a room and if she smells right, every man will go to her like flies to honey. Yep, powerful women. Can you say a little bit more about how to make that be more effective? 
<laughs> okay. So the way that you make that more effective is one by eating clean food. So of course, everything's organic. Um, so you start by not having toxins in your body that smell bad. I mean, when you go through menopause, a lot of women go are shocked at their scent change. So that's a brief period. But you can enhance your pheromones with body butters. You know, I love making products, you know, like the, um, I have these, I call them little one night stands. They're like little, a little massage ball that's only meant to be used once. And it might have um, whatever the scent is that your partner is attracted to. Because you want to use what will attract your partner to you. So if they're offended by the floral scents, you don't use those. You use things like um, the, the trees, you know, cedars and firs and um, bring the forest into the bed with you. You know, what is his dream? Does he want to be a lumberjack? You know, can I smell like the forest? And, um, or, you know, maybe it's floral scents, but I'd love to have a little set of essential oils and I have them uh, just waft it under their nose like this. You don't want to like, that's not right. You have to waft. And then you get way more scent. If you just snort it, it actually doesn't smell as much. So you determine what they like the scent of. Some people love the smell of cocoa butter. Some people hate it. You know, coconut oil is a great lube and it's a great carrier for essential oils. So other carriers might be argon oil or safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, avocado oil, but I love to use different oils for different purposes. You know, if there's a lot of inflammation, emu oil is great. Um, some things absorb into the skin quicker. So if you care about your sheets, you, know, <laughs> you might not use certain oils. You know, olive oil will leave a nice big stain. You know, <laughs> and the trick with sheet cleaning sheets, if they're oily, is get them in the wash right away with soap. The longer they sit, the more they oxidize and the darker the stain. Um, pheromones. <laughs> so pheromone is ferin means to care and harmon means to excite. You know, I mean, have you ever been with anyone that you were completely offended by their scent or they wore an aftershave and when they stopped using it, all of a sudden you didn't like them anymore. <laughs> you know, scent is powerful. I remember I was doing a birth. I did uh, labor and delivery for like 20 years. And I had to go from the emergency room in Chinatown in the hospital down through this ancient corridor and then up into the hospital because it was late at night and the doors weren't open. And when I was down in that corridor, that ancient corridor, I flashed back to when I was a small child and I was terrified. And I had this vision of being on a like trolley in this corridor alone. And so when I finished the birth, I called my mother up and I said, was I ever left in a corridor in a hospital. I must have been really young because I don't have a lot of intellectual memory around it. She said, well, yeah, but that you couldn't have remembered that. That was in Chinatown in Boston. I said, that's where I was. <laughs> so scent is our po most powerful memory. You know, it's like if you have a bad experience and, you know, somebody smokes cigars and every time you smell a cigar, you're gonna go back to that bad memory. So it's important to make sure the scents we do use 
around us are scents that support love and relaxation and um, you know affirm the things we want to be. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Um, we have another question from Betsy uh, about self esteem and self acceptance and self love, and if there are flower essences or plants um, that could help. Is that any the suggestion? To that is yes and yes. The plants, uh, I I believe that plants have an answer for everything. And I use, I have probably 300 flower essences that I go in and I douse. I believe in dowsing. If anyone doesn't douse, I'm a believer. You want to use your most definitive finger, not the wishy-washy finger that wants to please everyone. So thumb and fire finger. And you ask for a clear yes and a clear no, and your arm will move. It's hard for people who are pitta that are really in there, you know, like they want to know all the facts. You you have to make circles on the top of their heads so they get out of their mind. But you figure out a yes and a no, and I can go through 300 flower essences in five minutes. And I'm not attached. I studied with various people to learn flower essences, and I'm not attached to knowing the answer, and it's always right. <laughs> So self-esteem is so complicated. First, you have to find out why you lost self-esteem, which is complicated. And that's why I refer out to so many therapists between the plants, flower essences, essential oils. I do a lot of meditation. Um, you know, I'll take like, this is five mils. I'll take this little teeny tiny bottle that is like a little nubbin and I'll go through all my essential oils with somebody, figure out the right combination that makes them happy and then sit and do a meditation with them. That is very relaxing, a little journey where I'm wafting that oil under their nose during the meditation, taking them to a deep relaxed state and then they go home with this little ball, bottle. All they do is smell it. They don't have to put it in anything. They just keep it with them whenever they feel stressed out. They smell it and they're back into relaxation, just like that. See, we have a follow-up question on your uh, dowsing tool that you were using. Mm -hmm. Can you just maybe show it or, or say a little bit more about someone where someone could get it or if you made it? Or I, yes. I so this, this was- How they you want the you want it to be at least the length of the tip of your thumb to the tip of your longest finger. So this one's a little longer, which I prefer it to be longer because the longer it is, the easier it moves. And the base should be something heavy. I mean, you can douse with your keychain <laughs> or a necklace. Like I could take this off and douse with it. So um, my daughter made this. So this has a beautiful um, amethyst orb. And then she put all these beautiful little things. And then the top has this odd shape. It's quite wonderful to hold on to. I've used this since she was in high school and now she's got two kids and is a teacher. Um, and I have probably 20 different dowsing things that people have given me over the years. This is my favorite one, but anything heavy and you just, you want to allow your arm to move. I would not normally hold it up this high, but you, you know, it'll do something. It might go in circles, might go back and forth, might be still. Everybody's is different and you just figure out a yes and a no. So some people stop it in between and say, please indicate a clear no. So for me, you know, back and forth is yes and sideways is no. And then I like to test it. I just make a long list of things that I know are good or bad for me. And I just put my finger on the word, a pound of sugar. Is that good for me? No, no, a uh, glass of red wine. 
Oh yeah. Okay. And you go through and put things that you know are yeses or noes so that you kind of confirm in your own mind that you're on the right path. And it's a great way to order dinner or figure out if you should go out with that person ever again. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So we have a couple other questions too, just a more a little bit more diagnosis too. I don't know how much more material you wanted to cover. We're getting it uh, close to um, the Q and A time. We got ten minutes left. Okay, I'll just talk about one more thing, and that's yeah, elect go. electuaries. So electuaries are really simple. It's honey, and it's nice to have a honey without a lot of flavor. Like you don't want to get a dark honey; get a lighter one. And you just put one drop of rose essential oil, so rose auto essential oil, and you put it in a clear glass jar, small jar, like a one ounce jar, cap it, and you leave it in the sun, turning it every day for a week. And that rose is imbued into that honey. And then, you know, you can put it on your finger and, you know, Put it wherever and then your partner gets to lick it off it's fun <laughs> and i think let's see is there anything else i wanted to the lecturers we talked about lubrication talked about massage balls i could read you poetry <laughs> so my massage balls here is a little balm to put in your warm hand to teach you how to warm up slow to search and spread and make you glow to share with those you want to know. Much deeper, longer connected so your spirits soar above. And if alone in bed you land your passion balm quite simply manned in your own loving hand. <laughs> this that goes into the memoirs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that an original? Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> I say we have it. I mean, I have tons of other notes, but we can stop now. Yeah. Oh, I know. I don't, I don't want to stop. No, no, no we'll <laughs> ask questions. That's fine. No, we'll put, uh, I don't, I don't want to disrupt any other material. We're all. No, I, I got through most of it. Yeah. We're getting comments on how lovely your poem is. <laughs> um, so any, any suggestions on getting a partner if you don't have one, any, uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to leave it up to all of you to find me my perfect mate. Ooh. I'm ready. I'm available and I have a long list. I'm willing to compromise on eight, you know, 80% or better is good. <laughs> Well, we could send the list out our, on the uh, newsletter follow-up. And, and oh, yeah. It. Margie's available. <laughs> you have to show up in Marblehead. You've got a shed. Yeah. <laughs> That's not too long a list. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Oh, here's a question about uh, ingesting the rose essential oil in the honey. It's safe to ingest it because it's just a drop is the question. Yeah. And rose is safe topically. Like which essential oils are safe? Rose, lavender, rose, lavender. There's a third one, tea tree, I think. Those are the three that you can use directly on your skin. Everything else should be diluted into a one ounce carrier. But rose is super safe and it's used in food all the time. They use rose essential oil. In that food. Essential oil. Yeah, yeah, and they use bergamot, water. which is Minarda. Okay. Yeah, essential oils are used in foods frequently. Um, okay, so we had another question. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about your book in just a minute. That's well, let's, let's go there right now since you just read a poem and um, I'm a big fan of your book. Yeah, let's show everyone and show the beautiful art inside that she did herself. I own this. It's I highly recommend it. She did it's really great diagnostics in there and uh, maybe hold it up a little bit more it's hard to see there you go yeah look at that it's just beautiful it's like multi-sensory experience when you're reading it i and did that on purpose because uh, i wanted to 
people to be able to rest their brains. So every fourth page I had artwork on and my first printer went crazy. He was like, no, that's going to be too expensive. And, you know, I fought with him constantly about the quality of the artwork. I said, no, it has to look like my etchings. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so all the artwork is original by Margie and there's just so much in there. Her work on the Kay, endocrine system is awesome. Kay Parent did all the calligraphy and Matt Wood and I did all the diagnostics in coffee shops across the country. Yeah, but there's great drawings. We're not seeing too, but like of like there, like eyelashes and like fingernails and different lines on the face or the hands. There we go. Yeah. So you can really get a lot of diagnostic tools. Just, oh, that was really helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love this one. Let's see. This one with the split in the lip. Yeah. When Sarah was little, um, we w went to the movies and Brad Pitt was up in the screen and I said, oh, look, Brad Pitt had an ulcer when he was a teenager. Mom, shh. It's Brad Pitt. <laughs> and then great. it came out, you know, a year later or something. I was in the grocery store and the uh, those sensational magazines. It says Brad Pitt had ulcers as a teenager. I was like, yeah, nice. <laughs> I knew that. And you know. uh, Margie, the ride and glide recipe that you referenced is in that book. I know I saw it somewhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So if, if it's probably and if it back. isn't, I'll send it to you, and you can send it out to people. You know, what, I know I saw it, but I did actually. I Kathy Tran. I love this and I section. Do you use this section? Oh yeah, this that's, is yeah. the quick site. So you it has like this is all small intestine indicators. So if you know you see three indicators, it's definitely that organ. And so each organ has its own two pages to show what the indicators would be. So, yeah, it's a good book. It's great. I've used it a lot in my practice. I mean, I took the workshop from you where you covered this and I was so happy to have it in the book. Can you show the front cover again? Is that mugwort? No, it's a view. Oh, look at that. Is that beautiful? Yeah, so you can, um, so we have information about if you guys, how you wanna, if you wanna order that, how you can get your hands on a copy. It's massive, it's wonderful. Uh, weight bearing exercise. Weight bearing exercise, right? <laughs> yep. Um, and you just wanna make sure that you get the book directly from Margie. So use our link so you're buying it directly from her so that, right? I don't think it's, is there another way to do it? Even? I know it's sold is in Canada at Pacific oh. Rim College because I teach there. Oh. Um, okay. And I don't think they carry it anymore in London because I haven't had an order there in years. So I meant oh, great. Okay, and great. Don't buy it on Amazon or eBay. They have like the first edition for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Somebody wrote in, do you think this book is worth it? And I wrote in, absolutely not. Buy the new book for 140 shipped. <laughs> you yourself wrote in, that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, we'll highly recommend it. And uh, we'll put all that information. We'll do a follow up email for everyone um, with some of the topics that were discussed, some of the resources, we'll follow up with those. And then there will also be a link so that if you want to um, watch this again, it's been recorded, we'll put that in there too. So a couple other uh, questions. One of them was about, um, it was another diagnostic question. I think originally it was about pimples in this area yeah, in between okay. the eyebrows. And but if you could just talk about that area in general. Yeah. Okay, if it's inner eyebrow upward, it's gallbladder. The small intestine is the lower half of the forehead, large intestine is the upper part. So large intestine, you're gonna have the upper forehead. You're gonna have these lines here, across here, and in between the normal line in your chin and your lip, if you get another line there, that's large intestine. And small intestine will be the um, lower forehead and then the backs of the arms and the backs of the shoulders and cystic pimples in this area. And then gallbladder is here. You can all feel how healthy your gallbladder is just by about the size of a 
silver dollar, you feel the tissue and then go above and feel that tissue and compare it and below. And if this part here is too oily, too dry, has pimples, that tells you the state of your gallbladder. So what about the lines here? Is this so like the middle the line somehow? The yeah. middle line is the liver and the side lines are the gallbladder. And you can't really separate the liver and gallbladder, can you? You can separate it by taking it out of you, but that just puts more work on the liver. Can you say more about the back of the arms and how that goes? So small intestine will be on the backs of the arms. You'll have little red um, pimples that just never go away. They're like always there. Um, and also across the backs of the shoulders. Um, so small intestine, you're going to have wide open pores on your skin. So your pores should be close and tight. So this is another indicator. And what it means is you've got um, your small intestine is too porous and stuff is passing out. And you, that's why you get rashes and pimples. Because so that being leaky gut. Leaky gut, yeah, exactly. Great. Let me just so where else? Lungs, kidneys are your ears and under your eyes, but under your eyes for kidneys is puffy. If it's blue black, it's liver gallbladder. If it's brown, it's colon. Looks like poop. Um, and then you can figure out, you know, when people say, how long do I have to take these herbs? If, if you divided your eye in half and a quarter of the way you had marking like blue black would be liver gallbladder so if it goes a quarter of the way that's one to three months if it's halfway it's three to six months three quarters nine months and all the way longer than a year <laughs> I remember in your workshop, you had some really great um, thyroid uh, yeah. cues. Yeah, would you mind? Yeah. So if you have patchy outer eyebrows or even missing eye outer eyebrows, that's hypothyroid. And if you have a, a line above and below the, looks like baby thighs sort of, above and below the thyroid, that's hypothyroid. If you walk... Um, instead of with your hands at your sides like this, with your hands flipping to the back, that's hypothyroid. And it's one of my students was with her father at the um, thyroid clinic with him and, you know, a big hospital. There were a, a whole room full of thyroid people. And she had them all go in a circle and march around. And she could diagnose who had hypo and who had hyper by how their palms were. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Um, so hypo, so both can have um, sleep irregularities, but hypothyroid is more apt to have like dull hair, dull eyes, dull mind. Hyperthyroid is more apt to have big bug eyes, you know, like they kind of look like they're all, you know, stunned all the time with dark circles under their eyes because they'll stay up for three days cleaning the house. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Pancreas? Pancreas, you're going to see spleen and pancreas I kind of blend together. And so you'll have rivulets coming down here and the color will be yellow. And you'll have a little spleen bean it looks like a kidney bean right in the upper eye socket and it's puffy and whitish so people with diabetes will have that and people who've had an accident where their spleen was damaged will have that um uh, uh what is it pituitary gland just um two fingers up on the left side from the crest of the ear a woman, I don't know for men, but a woman will get a sort of a cystic pimple at ovulation if their pituitary is out of balance. And then once they're through ovulation, it recedes. 
it's not really a pimple. It's just an, and, and it is exactly where the uh, acupressure, acupuncture point is for the pituitary gland. I found that I out found that. fairly recently. It was like, right on. <laughs> wow, that's, that's really cool. So you could just even like, if you had it, just right, push on it. Yeah. Like, acupressure, yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's like when you have pineal issues, so the third eye, you you have, um, uh, oh, I'm getting tired now. It's uh, night and day, happy and sad, circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. You know, so people with depression or can't, you know, can't sleep. And the best way to reset your pineal gland is to get up right before sunrise and watch you know how the red comes up when the sun is rising in the horizon and you just gaze out up, up on it and that red rising sun, don't look at it too long or you can't see for hours, um, resets your pineal gland. Like when I would travel all the time and go from a six hour here to London or to, to Hawaii or something, I would always get up early and reset my pineal gland, and then I'd be fine. Wow, great. Back in the day when you could travel. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other, I think I've, unless there's any other questions, you guys, I think I got them all. Um, just double checking here. Uh, any other pearls of wisdom or any other pearls of your marks, beautiful poetry, anything you want to share, advice, mm. a song, or? Well, we were, I think before you all came on, we were talking about how for the last couple of years, I've been writing my memoirs. So you can look forward to that. I, I asked um, one of the local presses, I said, well, I've been, you know, I've been writing my memoirs and I'm trying to decide if I should have a suedo nom, you know, because I don't want my family to sue me. And she said, well, if it was anyone else, I'd say, go ahead. But no, you have to write it in your name. <laughs> It's like, oh, shoot, <laughs> I could be in trouble here. Yeah, oh. Rosita Arvegos writing hers too. I'm sure hers will be way more serious than mine. But. Oh, we can't wait. We all want to read it for sure. <laughs> Get ideas. <laughs> well, Mari, it's been so great having you. Thank you. It's just, uh, I took so many notes and um, we're getting all kinds of comments about and thank you. It's just, this is wonderful. So. Thanks for being with us and being willing to participate in this weird format. And <laughs> you rocked it, of course. Great. Well, I'm glad it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. It was a long day. I was exhausted, but once I started talking, I was fine. You got the you got the power. Uh, yeah, I know it's later for you, so we appreciate you you staying up on our behalf. So you great. Lots of people saying thank you and oh, how, how great welcome. it was to be with you. So great. I do need to do a little commercial for the guild. Um, so I'm going to put us in a different view here. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I'll keep you on screen, Margie. So um, just want to thank everyone for coming. We'll have another meeting next uh, next month about Herb Farm and 40 years of growing. Uh, you can find that on our website or watch for that information in our newsletter. We are a nonprofit. So um, if you want to toss a five dollars our way for this if you liked what you saw check out our website become a member sign up for the newsletter get involved um we we do good work as you can see um and have great great folks so thanks to everyone for coming we'll post this online and again just watch for the newsletter and uh, you'll be able to access it there or on the website so thanks again everyone for coming thank you so much margie my pleasure appreciate it take care okay bye bye, right. bye.